Psychedelics, an interview with David Bronner from Dr. Bronner's. I'm excited to speak to you because I think you do something rare that most companies aren't able to or don't know how to do it. So I want to kind of get into that. Um, your brand has all, like, always stood for morality um, and what it means to be a moral person. Um, why is that so hard for other companies to do? Yeah, <clears throat> well, I mean, I, we, we are um, uniquely privileged to have uh, my granddad, uh, Dr. Bronner, who's our founder. He founded our company as a nonprofit religious organization to promote his vision of world peace and that all the faith traditions at their mystical core were saying the same thing. It's, you know, love is the ground of our being and we need to realize our transcendent unity across these ethnic and religious divides and we're going to kill ourselves. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and there's a lot of history in there, but, you know, the IRS disagreed with this tax exempt uh, nonprofit status. So we, we, reorg we re reorganize as a for profit. We have that kind of mission, that nonprofit mission at the heart of our DNA. Um, and yeah, I mean, my granddad, my, my, fam my, my mom and dad, um, my brother and, and brother-in-law who are currently operating the company, we've just always looked at money as energy to make the world better. I mean, it's not, it's not to be accumulated, but it's about, you know, it's just how, how can we leverage this business? How can we leverage our organization, our financial resources to improve the world? Um, and yeah, I think people, there's just a lot of people that don't quite have that kind of relationship with money. They have a more problematic one um, and it kind of ends up ruling uh, their choices and not vice versa. Um, people aren't okay. making ethical choice with regards to how to deploy money versus chasing money that isn't being done in an ethical way. And um, I think it's interesting what you're saying because what, from what I'm hearing from you, it started off as how do we do good and then the business came from it instead of most businesses starting how do we make money and then maybe consider okay now I think maybe it's the way you it was built on the basis of doing good yeah it's an issue it's a good way of looking at it i mean we kind of i mean my, my grandma was a good businessman i mean he knew what he was doing but i mean first and foremost he, it was about the mission and he wouldn't sell to you if you didn't want to listen to him you know i mean for him the label was everything the lady he downloaded his message you know when he realized people were coming like word got out that this is a gosh darn dang good soap and people were coming to hear him speak but not really listening and just getting the soap and taking off so then he put the he put all of his uh, message on the label and for him that label which is you know now three thousand words on each of our ports <clears throat> i mean the soap was there to sell the label more than the label was there to sell the soap and um you know and, and yeah so that definitely it's always been kind of a mission first organization um you know we do operate a good you know, a tight ship and know what we're doing as far as producing good quality soap and sustainable margins and and uh, you know and everything having to do with running a good business but yeah it's really it's in service to the to the mission um, it's, it's almost like a holistic approach of cleaning not cleaning the heart soul mind and the body externally it's just an all-round cleaning job <laughs> yeah it's right i mean that my granted i mean that you know like all the symbolism of, of cleansing and you're in your kind of inner sanctum in the shower and he's downloading his message or you forgot a magazine when you went in the bathroom and and he's got you you know uh and, he, and he's with you in those intimate moments um yeah you know it's, it's it is really about yeah cleaning on every level it's was clean the situation up so speaking of cleaning the situation up, let's talk about how someone jumps from soap to psychedelics. It seems like, are we, are we cleaning our whole essence here as well? Where does that come in from? Exactly. Uh, well, it, it's, uh, it's um, I mean, I feel like it's the most resonant. So like, you know, looking at our company, not so much as a, as a soap company, but as an activist engine to do good in the world. And, and in particular, my granddad's all one vision. And you know, growing up, it was a little over my head. I mean, my granddad was coming from the mountaintop, you know, 24 seven, you know, he had the ovens of the Holocaust behind him. He, you know, his parents were claimed, he, came from, he was a third generation master soap maker, German Jewish soap making family. Um, 
And, um, you know, his response to the tragedy and enormity of the Holocaust was to see the, the you know, somehow unpack that, um, that all the religious traditions of the world are at their heart, you know, saying the same thing. And it's when religions take themselves too seriously and make idols out of their beliefs and start killing each other. And that's when it get, you know, goes off the rails. But, you know, at its mystical heart, and, and he just felt in a new part of the world, he was just so urgently called to, you know, promote his vision. But what was, what was the point? I was, I, what was the question there? How you get from soap to psychedelics. Oh, yeah. So, so you know, so, so for him, that was, that was, you know, what he was doing 24-7, was uniting the world, like, we must unite this spaceship Earth, we're all one or not. And, you know, and, you know, it was, it was kind of sailing over our heads as kids coming up. And, you know, my dad kind of reacted against my granddad. Um, you know, kind of wanted nothing to do with the cosmic trip. He, my granddad wasn't the best father. And, um, and my dad kind of showed up. He was all about showing up for your family and your community. And what can you practically do? You know, of course, United Peace on Earth, that's great. But, you know, what, what can you actually do, like, right here, right now? And, and so we, we really try and honor both our granddad and dad's example. And I feel in some ways I'm kind of more resonating to my granddad um, than my brother or others in my company. And I'm just kind of more on that frequency. Um, but I, like my brother, we both see my dad as uh, our key inspiration and moral example. And we've always been like, well, how do you, what do you, what can we practically do? And, you know, and that's like in your supply chains, we have these, you know, huge agricultural supply um, chains producing our coconut oil, our palm oil, our olive oil. You know, how, how can we make sure those are, you know, that's where we can have the most impact and immediate leverage. And let's make sure those farmers are being paid a fair price and their workers are being paid fairly and they're taking care of their land in a regenerative organic way without a huge amounts of synthetic pesticides. And then in our community, you know, what can we do? And we cap all our salaries at five times our lowest paid position. And, you know, what, what kind of projects, what kind of charities, what kind of campaigns can we support to that are making the incremental progress um but i would say the cause but you know going to my granddad's of like world peace you know like what the leverage point and the cause that i feel is most on in line with that is integration of psychedelic medicine and therapy that you know while we're on that in, does everyone that? Have, does everyone have to agree in the family and and is there a vote no, 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 no. They, so, so for my family, they, they support this, um, is for me. Um, and, and each of us kind of have our own passion projects. And, you know, for me, I'm really passionate about integration, psychedelic therapy. I'm very passionate about regenerative organic agriculture, regenerative organic agriculture, uh, you know, and, and, and animal welfare. And I mean, that's, that's actually really core to the, to the company's mission and ethos. You know, psychedelic therapy is been on a journey. Uh, it was initially, it was to say it was kind of my personal project way over there, but it, it, over time, and that, as the, cult, the culture at large, the global culture is now going through a renaissance, so is my family, and I mean, we're ahead of it, but they're starting to see it, you know, it's not just me, you know, that's cool, but just do it over there. They're, they're starting to really embrace it, and not so much in terms of this is going to open people's hearts and minds and, and result in peace and earth and three you know, in under three decades or, you know, whatever optimistic scenario I secretly have. But, uh, and, and I don't know, I mean, I mean it might take longer. It's a, it's a generational program, but they resonate to the healing properties. I mean, there's no disputing that for the epidemics of, of addiction and depression and end of life anxiety and these debilitating conditions um, that psychedelic therapy is, you know, just such a needed medicine, such a needed modality. And that's where my family really embraces uh, the project. Um, not so much on how we can restore our connection to each other and the earth and nature and, you know, and figure out how to live responsibly and be better citizens. And, you know, that, that level is something like, you know, it's like you gotta be more intimately experienced and they're not as, you know, they don't have that kind of relationship. Um, so, so I, you know, I kind of see it maybe in a more ambitious way than they do, but they absolutely see the societal benefit that immediate integration of these therapies 
will result in. That's incredible because it's not always easy for families to embrace it. Um, you know, I, certainly my, you know, people I've told about it think, well, first cannabis and now psychedelics, like, uh, like I've lost the plot. Um, but now it is coming up. There's a lot of um, talk about it. It's definitely at the surface. So what I would like to know from you, and, and we actually just had a panel last night about mainstreaming, is do you like what you see? Do you like where it's headed? Because you're so socially aware of doing right. But is everyone, and is everyone going to do it right in this space? Yeah, that's, uh, and I'll come back to that question. I just, like your prior question, I just wanted to, to yeah, say sure. to you, Two key people that really helped sell my family. Well, one did and one is about to. So the one who did uh, was doc, Dr. Richard Rockefeller. Um, he's he was an, he uh, he worked closely with Maps and and Rick. <clears throat> um, I, you know he got inspired by the power of MDMA therapy. He was a physician and really understood from the inside out um, how MDMA therapy worked. He could really break it down. In terms of down, you know, how it would tamp down the amygdala, the fear center of the of the brain, and allow like really traumatic experience to be processed and and you know restored into a normal memory structure that wasn't re-traumatizing. Just a, a beautiful man, and he died tragically a few years ago. But um, when he really presented to my family, it really like that was what really um, I think connected with them and resulted in us making a multi, uh, a five-year commitment, a million dollars a year to MAPS to help um, drive MMA through FDA approval process. And then likewise, um, Dr. Rachel Yehuda from the Bronx Veterans VA, Bronx VA, um, will be presenting on Tuesday, my family, and she's just amazing. And they haven't heard her yet, but, um, uh, we're, you know, I'm gonna be asking my family for another level of support. And I feel like she's like uniquely situated to really make the case as someone who is very, very skeptical herself, but understands PTSD like nobody else in the world. And, you know, and, and that she came around and started to really understand the power of MMA therapy. I think her journey and just how, you know, how much she believes in it now is going to be extremely helpful to unlocking another level of support from my family. Um, to your incredible. question. Yeah. Because PTSD is one of those things that up until now, people with, with, who suffer from it usually just can help the symptoms sometimes with cannabis or some therapy. But MDMA seems to have really found, I don't want to say cure, but it's really taken people to have a, a proper day-to-day yeah. -day life, right? So you can't put a price on that. No, absolutely. And, and uh, Rachel has a um, metaphor. She says, like, tr processing this level of deep trauma is like giving birth. Like, it's like, it's incredibly powerful, painful, long ordeal. But then you've, you've kind of done it, you know, but, but like, going some, somebody going in like once a week for 20 or 30 minutes and getting some SSRIs, you know, you're not going to, that's not how you deal with the, the level of trauma at issue with you know, treatment resistant PTSD. And, um, so yeah, so it's, uh, yeah. it's, it's, it's a miraculous therapy. And, 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 and she says that the medicine makes the therapy work better. She says it's not that, like the outcome of successful ther treatment of PTSD is always that the kind of the memory is no longer traumatizing. It's now a normal memory. It's not like in the amygdala, it's not re-traumatizing. So the medicine is, is basically just really just enabling a whole other level of efficacy of a trained therapist to really help the person process. And in that movie, um, Trip of Compassion, the Israeli movie, Trip of Compassion is just so incredible. I think it's pretty much the best um, visual, visualization of the healing process um, that's, that's been done. So Yeah, it's incredible. I sat with Nachum from, Nachum Pinch from the he was in the documentary and he told his story and he's also an incredible human being and to actually meet someone that's had to go through that and come out the other end, you can't yeah. deny, you just can't deny what it does. Um, but going back to what you think the future is for psychedelics yeah. and do you like how it looks, um, should we be nervous? You know, people are really yeah. passionate about it because we had this webinar last night and there, there were some angry people. Um, uh, obviously very supportive people, but there were some people that were anti, um, anti it and fearful and there's wariness. Um, 
and I mean the wary of like that the corporate interests coming into the exactly yeah yeah no absolutely I have concerns as well I think um, cannabis is a pretty cautionary example of um, kind of like a lot of corporate financial interests coming in that are you know I mean the hope was I think for a lot of us as activists in the cannabis space I mean I've been working to end cannabis prohibition for 25 years and um, you know we've given enormous amounts of resources and um, you know, and we're still doing it. I mean, we're giving another million bucks this year to end prohibition in, in like three red states. Um, in, in the U.S., we want to, you know, get some more conservative states, and that should set up the end game at the federal level. Um, but yeah, you know, you just get a lot of people coming in that don't have a very high vibrating consciousness. Um, they're kind of just looking to make money, and um, I would, you know, I think that psychedelics can definitely um, Hopefully we do a better job with psychedelics. And I think MAPS being nonprofit is hugely important that we basically have a nonprofit pharma company and green the field. Um, USONA on the psilocybin side uh, is a nonprofit taking it psilocybin through for major depression. Um, and they're, they've got five MEO in, you know, they've, they've got some in other, other, uh, other medicines in the pipeline. But I think, yeah, having, um, I mean, it's not that a, a for-profit can't be awesome. Obviously we're for-profit and we're doing pretty good. And, um, and there's definitely nonprofits that are really lame. It's, I guess that's not like a, a super um, strict kind of way to slice it. But just generally speaking, um, yeah, the for-profit, when they come in and they're beholden the investors, especially if they're set up in a traditional kind of maximizing fiduciary return for the shareholder kind of way. Yeah, you know, it's just that there is some concern with that, you know, um, yeah. So, I mean, we're hopeful that you will see ethical business models get set up where, you know, they really are trying to benefit all the stakeholders, um, provide therapeutic access to the most marginalized, um, you know, just generally have a bigger, picture and like a view of only if society as a whole is prospering and benefiting is it am I and or should I um, so yeah I guess you know uh, I don't want to yeah there's concern just because it, it can go definitely in a not great way but I think I mean hopefully there'll be some real players nonprofit and for-profit that do have really good ethics that can really establish themselves and I think, you know, in, the, in this particular, like when you talk about ther psychedelic therapy, I think people are going to want to reward companies that are vibrating in a higher way, um, hopefully. Um, I think that'll be important. I think definitely like MAPS will benefit in that way, you know, being a MAPS certified clinic, for example, like we're kind of contemplating, like, how do we do a, you know, kind of certification for clinics or, or something like that, or at least best practices. And, you know, maybe put like a map seal of approval on, on certain kinds yeah. of clinics and that kind of thing. And, you know, try and modulate or, 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 you know, just establish consumer awareness over like kind of better versus worse practitioners yeah. and service providers. And, yeah. I think MAPS has done that. They've managed to set up a nice foundation to almost enforce people to follow a certain um, path. Um, and they've set an amazing example. And it's funny because even though this re-emergence renaissance is coming after cannabis. In a lot of ways, psychedelics is, is more advanced because of all the research that was done previously. And there's a lot of knowledge there's, you know, that's been collected, um, which is really incredible. But I mean, I've got a question. It, it must be hard to always do good, to be, a, to be socially conscious and also be a profitable business. And I wonder if you ever find yourself conflicted um, like Between. I want to do bad. You're right. I do want to do bad. I, I go get, I go and get, yeah. Um, no, I, uh, um, I, I'm not that, I'm not conflicted. I mean, I, it's generally, um, um, you know, we, we're, we're so mission based. I mean, I'm, uh, but yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm all about like breaking rules that are dumb and, uh, having a good time. So, um, uh, um, but yeah, you know, I, I think that we've got to 
kind of proven out a business model where doing the right thing, you know, fighting the good fights gets us a lot of media attention. Um, our customers appreciate it. Um, and I think that's, you know, I think there is, especially with the millennial, well, whatever, but it, it you know, there's a lot of types of millennials, but um, just uh, statistically speaking, more of a desire for authenticity and um, you know, a, a real commitment to social and environmental concerns and, and issues. Um, I think businesses that um, set themselves up in a sincere way are going to be rewarded. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, I hear what you're saying. It's, you know, it's a philosophy of doing good and good comes back to you. Um, and, I, you know, I, I believe in that. I think that's, that's true. Even if you do good for your neighbor and good, you know, everyone does good. It just makes the whole world a better place. Um, can I ask you to describe about your relationship and partnership with Decriminalize Nature? Can you tell me a little bit about that? Yeah, so I actually just wrote a, um, an article for the MAP Spring Bulletin. Um, and it's, uh, you know, if you Google David Bronner, and it's called um, uh, The Unified Field Theory of Psychedelic Integration in Portugal Style Decriminalization. Um, but in there, I talk about the key strategies to integrate psychedelic therapy and mainstream psychedelic medicine. And of course, we've got the FDA approval route um, that MAPS and USONA and others are following. And that's crucially important in generating these like amazing studies and um, really moving the culture in a significant way. Um, but as we approach the successful conclusion of that, uh, and, and we're very close now, you know, a couple of years away of FDA approval, um, I think it's really important to start to pivot and look at, okay, well, that was kind of the way we were wedging into the culture, but we want universal access. We don't want narrow qualifying diagnoses only, like only if you have, you know, treatment resistant PTSD or only if you have a clinical diagnosis of major depressive disorder. You know, we want this available for everyone. Everybody's struggling. Everybody can benefit hugely from these medicines that they're all about just helping us be our better selves and work out stuff. We've all got some level of trauma and some level of stuff. Um, Especially yeah. now, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, and right with COVID. I mean, it's just like, I mean, everything's just accelerating. So yeah, the urgency of bringing these medicines in and, and you know, reconnecting and healing ourselves up and, and connecting us with each other and with nature and grappling with these huge environmental and social problems is it's, it's really urgent. So, you know, a couple other strategies are, um, so that you noted decriminalized nature. So this is um, uh, basically uh, a strategic effort to, well, it started in Denver. So the decriminalized Denver, decriminalized mushrooms last spring um, and somewhat unexpectedly, and it happened on my birthday when they had to come from behind when we, we were financial supporters, but I was, I was mostly like, well, they're triggering a great conversation wasn't necessarily thinking they're going to win. And then it was like, wow. So they won. And it was just such a beautiful moment. And it's basically kind of about, you know, democratizing the medicine and, and making sure everyone can access it. And, you know, not everyone's going to be able to afford therapy or have a proper diagnosis. Um, you know, part of the concern with that is, you know, really optimizing set and setting, you know, having proper preparation, proper integration. So hand in hand with that, that, those decriminalization campaigns or education campaigns about how to approach the medicine and how to sit for each other. Um, you know, and it's, you know, that doesn't have the degree of rigor of like the FDA clinical approach, but is hugely important. And, you know, you can have hugely healing, liberating experiences out in the forest or at home at a concert. I mean, there, there's, there's all kinds of ways to, relate to the medicines outside of a therapeutic context. But another, and, and so I think that's very important to support and we're supporting decriminalized nature campaigns in DC in particular, uh, some, uh, a bit in Portland and in Chicago. Um, you know, it's just a movement on fire just spreading to, to cities across the world. Um, and then the, the other major strategy is in Oregon, there's a, a ballot measure called the, it's a, the psilocybin services initiative, but it's basically legalizing psilocybin therapy um, in the state of Oregon that would basically replicate the FDA kind of approach and have a, a, a therapist training program. Um, and actually it's not, it, it basically would license therapist training programs. So it doesn't actually, it, it would license 
third party therapist training program so long as they meet certain criteria. And we have like an all star cast. We got Francoise Brizat, she just wrote the book Consciousness Medicine, she's, she's amazing. Um, Robin Cart Harris, um, got uh, Mark Hayden, like people just, you know, some, some heavyweights helping our chief petitioners there, Tom and Sheree Eckert, uh, build out this therapist training program. But we're right now qualifying that for the Met, for the Oregon vote or the for the November vote in Oregon, and if we win that, that basically means anybody can access psilocybin therapy if you're not contraindicated. You know, so there'll be you know criteria on you know no schizophrenia, and you know there's there's definitely indications that preclude psilocybin as a as a medicine. But you know, barring that, everybody should access and and this does it in a way and brings it into the culture in that kind of very careful, you know, really optimizing and controlling the, the set and setting and, and optimizing healing outcomes. You know, there's requires a preparation session, requires integration sessions. Um, so we're in a way I'm most excited by that. I mean, I, I do believe in decriminalizing the medicine, um, but I also want to make sure that we're bringing models into the culture where the real healing and mystical power of these medicines can be optimized and, and I do feel like the therapeutic container is the western analog to the indigenous ceremonial container that mm -hmm. you know in, in like decriminalization I mean I'm all about cognitive liberty and, and having doing medicine in all kinds of ways but it's a whole different game when you really put huge intention into it it's a higher dose you're really releasing you have somebody holding the space so you don't have to stress about stuff and you can just release inward so I'm, I'm really excited by that Oregon model because I think it combines the best of the, the rigor from the FDA clinical kind of path but making it accessible to, to everybody. And did you say they'll know if that passes in Oregon? Yeah that'll, that, that'll be voted on in early November you know, during the presidential election in Oregon so and in Oregon as well. So, in, and if we win, we feel like then that'll really bust open the, the gates. It'll set a precedent for the rest of the country. Yeah. But also in Oregon is a broad-based Portugal-style decriminaliza decriminal decriminalization measure that would decriminalize all drugs, Portugal-style, and shift from mass incarceration of drug addicts to a treatment, not jail approach. Um, and the drug wars, just, there, there's this book called The New Jim Crow, and it's really good in reading it right now. And it talks about the systemic racism in, in American society from, from our founding, from slavery. Yeah, the, the New Jim Crow. Yeah. And then after the Civil War and slavery was over, then a new institution of racial control was implemented called Jim Crow, and it was this whole other, you know, segregation. So they are segregation. And then when that ended, then you had the rise of the drug war as the new form of racial control. And it's like all disguised and it's a different form of racial control, but basically the drug war has always been targeted at people of color. And, you know, like the Mexican, the Marijuana Tax Act, it's all about going after Mexican immigrants. Um, and, um, and you just look at the, the arrest rates, you know, the, the use rates of, are identical across white and, and, and people of color as far as dealers and users and, but the, the, the amount of incarceration is eight times higher for, for black versus white men. And so it's, just, I think, crucial to, as we are liberating our psychedelic medicines and bringing them out of the draconian drug war, to not lose sight that even with really hard drugs of abuse, addiction is, is not, a, it's not a crime. This is, it should be treated. These are people who are suffering. Like, how, how do we treat them? How do we deliver psychedelic therapy, which is such an amazing treatment for for breaking drug addiction and you know just really bad cycles of thought and behavior um so we really like in oregon that we have both a measure to bring psilocybin therapy and make it available for everyone at the same time as we're decriminalizing drug all drugs and moving to a portugal style treatment not jail approach so it's a really beautiful i think example that would be incredible i mean it's an, it's amazing work and and i think that not only is it great that the discussion of psychedelic therapy has come to the surface, but the discussion about mental health has come yeah. to the surface. It's been so ignored. No one wants to, to know about it. You say you the know, word cancer or any other sickness and everyone's there, but mental health people are like, don't you, want to go near it, you know? 
Yeah, right on. I mean, it's almost like the best part of psychedelic therapy is the therapy part. You know, just getting what people in a therapy period is going to be huge. I mean, of course, psychedelic assisted therapy is way better. But yeah, I mean, there's just so much. Yeah. I mean, I, I mean, it took me forever to get my butt in therapy and that was a huge help. Um, and, and yeah, so I think, uh, yeah, just increasing acknowledgement of mental health issues and the destigmatization of, uh, you know, and, and get, really helping people get the treatment they need is huge. It's a big part of the psychedelic renaissance. It's just, yeah, the, you know, let's not put this in, under the rug. You know, people are really suffering. Like postpartum depression, like, it's like, Every month, I mean, it's like ridiculous. All these like new months, like they're like, what the hell's wrong with me? I like, want to yeah. kill myself. I want to drive out the, you know, yeah. but so many mothers have it, but it's such a stigma that I shouldn't be thinking like that. That's crazy. I can't tell me, but you know. And there's yeah. so many levels. There's all these people that are not suffering from serious depression, but just taking antidepressants because they're just not coping on a certain level. And they're so depressing, those medicines. I've been on them. It's like, you just don't feel anything. There's yeah. no creativity. There's no sex drive. There's just blah. So yeah. you need another option. Just I yeah. don't know. Just need, it's just not right not to give people what they need. And I, I just want to ask you to to end our conversation. Um, is what do you see in the next five years for Dr. Bronner's for psychedelics? I know that's a big question to like kind of say concisely, but yeah. But um, I mean, I you know definitely will. I mean. So for Bronner's, it's future's bright. We're we're, we're doing really well, and, and uh, you know we have this uh, really awesome ethical business model to support our causes and charitable partners, and really psyched that um, to make real progress on on all the different issue areas we're engaged on. But most importantly, I guess personally, yeah, the psychedelic renaissance is is upon us, and really excited for that. Um, just want to definitely make sure it's um yeah being done right and help you know make sure hope, hope companies get big in the space and organizations succeed that really do have a, a real deep ethical commitment um so that's that's my hope in, in the coming years and yeah well i thank you very much and i think you're an excellent model you should have kids books so that they're already at a young age being uh, inspired to do good um and, uh, you know, I just think the work that you're doing is incredible to, to be able to succeed professionally and to do good at the same time is a, an example for everyone. Um, and thank you very much for having the time to speak to us here at SciTech. Yeah, thank you for having me. And I should say just on the, on the side of earth, like, yeah, just all the people who need the healing are able to access the healing and heal themselves up. And, love one another and be their most awesomest rad selves and you know just be in harmony and, and yeah figure out peace on earth forever and ever yeah. amen and we hope to see you in israel one day really soon yeah i want to get over there yeah on the other that side would of be incredible. thank yeah. you so much david thank you bye, bye.